Hello, everyone, and thank you all for joining us this afternoon. I'm Zach Graves, Digital Director at the R Street Institute. First off, I'd like to thank Jerry Brito and Ladan Narasta at the Mercatus Center for helping me organize today's Hangout. Both R Street and Mercatus put out major scholarly works on copyright reform at the end of April, bringing renewed interest in the free market case uh, for reform. In addition, under the direction of Chairman Goodlatte, the House Judiciary Subcommittee on Courts, Intellectual Property, and the Internet has had several hearings on copyright already this year, with more planned in the coming weeks. These have considered issues such as music and video licensing, preservation of copyrighted works, digital goods, and first sale issues. Additionally, the Copyright Office has recently requested the issue to be brought up again in Congress. Our panel today includes Ryan Radia, an Associate Director of Technology Studies at the Competitive Enterprise Institute. His work focuses on adapting law and public policy to the unique challenges of the information age. Mitch Stoltz is a staff attorney at the Electronic Frontier Foundation focusing on intellectual property issues. Previously, he worked on copyright and antitrust litigation at the firm Constantine Cannon LLP. Before that, he was chief security engineer at Netscape Communications and Mozilla.org. Tom W. Bell is professor at the Dale E. Fowler School of Law at Chapman University. He previously worked at the law firm Wilson, Sonsini, Goodrich, and Rosati, and is the former director of telecommunications and technology studies at the Cato Institute. His new book, Intellectual Privilege, Copyright, Common Law, and the Common Good, was just published by the Mercatus Center. Derek Khanna is an associate fellow at the R Street Institute and a visiting fellow at Yale Law School's Information Society Project. He was previously, or should I say infamously, a congressional staffer for the Republican Study Committee. He recently published a much-discussed paper with the R Street Institute on the conservative case for restoring a constitutional vision of copyright. To kick things off, I'd like to start with Tom W. Bell to give a brief introduction to the problems with our current copyright system and to look at some ways in which we might thinking about, think about addressing them. Right. Thank you, Zach, and thank you, R Street Institute, for hosting us. And as Zach mentioned, I have this uh, new book out, Intellectual Privilege. And um, I guess the title alone tells you a lot of what I think about copyright. My views are in contrast to fellow friend, friends of property. I consider myself um, a huge fan of tangible property rights. And I think my friends on the right have kind of made a mistake in lumping copyright together with other types of property. In my view, it's not a type of property. It's better understood as a form of privilege. And so there you go. Again, that's, that's why I'm trying to get intellectual privilege uh, in current use. So when people use IP, they can think it's not property, but privilege. So why do I think that? Well, there's a lot in the book about that. I'll just tell you very quickly that um, for one reason is I really admire the founders. And I really admire the approach they had to copyright. And when you look at the 1790 Copyright Act, that was the first Copyright Act the United States published. Note the date. It's one year after they ratified the Constitution, so it's many of the same people. When they, when they created copyright in 1790, they did it in a very lean and mean way. Copyright then only lasted for a maximum of 28 years. So one of the things I've done with the Mercatus Institute, I so admire what the founders have done, is that we've released the book under the founders' copyright. And I want this to serve as an example to other people. I want to show them that they, too, can emulate the founders. So there you go. When you get your book and you read this notice on the inside cover, we're basically going to let this fall in the public domain in 14, 28 years because we admire the founders. I don't think the founders viewed copyright as a form of property. And I talk about that in the book. We could talk about it later. I just want to say that. Another thing I want to observe about copyright, the question today is, has it gone too far? And I would say almost certainly, but one point I want to make is it's very hard to tell. Let's not pretend, as policy wonky as we are, that we have precise numbers to calibrate copyright exactly, to put it in delicate balance. People talk about copyright being in delicate balance. I, I don't think that's how it works at all. What happens is lawmakers make it bigger and bigger. It's not balanced at all. Here's a chart from the book. You can get a public, a public domain version of this chart, by the way, on Wikipedia. And this chart shows the term of copyright over time. You can see down at one end the 1790 Copyright Act, 28 years maximum. And it just keeps getting longer and longer. And note that dotted line in there. What's going on with that? That's, I call that the Mickey Mouse curve. And basically, that shows 
what happens every time it looks like the copyright in Steamboat Willie is about ready to hit the public domain. Now, I don't know exactly what goes on behind closed doors in Washington, but coincidentally or not, every time Steamboat Willie, Willie starts approaching the public domain, lawmakers increase the copyright. It's happened twice now. Looks like it's going to happen again before 2023. And what's that show? That shows that copyright is subject, it's not in delicate balance, it's, in, it's subject to intense public choice pressures that tend to make it bigger and bigger all the time. And where are we today with copyright? Well, it serves big corporate publishers, to be sure, but it does so to the detriment of individual authors and artists. It really does. I've talked to a lot of attorneys in the field, and they'll tell you the way copyright is set up now, the little guys do not get much mercy. Works great for Time Warner, Sony, big media companies. They have good lobbyists. Maybe that's just a coincidence, but it's not. <laughs> doesn't work so well for individuals. And last thing, it doesn't work so well for the public because copyright restricts our freedom. I think friends of freedom need to take that very seriously. I cannot go out on a public street and recite Martin Luther King's I Have a Dream speech. It's actually under copyright. It's held by a British conglomerate. So for me to go out and publicly perform his speech or to replay it, you can buy a CD for 20 bucks. To play his CD, uh, uh, play a, a DVD of his, of his I Have a Dream speech would put me in copyright violation. Potentially $150,000 in statutory damages. That is very powerful speech and it's being cut off. So in that and other ways, copyright limits our freedom. I think that's very troubling. Friends of Liberty should think harder about that before they jump on the property bandwagon. And I think they should reconceive copyright, not as property, but as a form of government privilege. Doesn't mean it's bad per se, but it does mean we should look at it very critically. Gentlemen, take it away. Uh, Derek, would you like to take it from here? Sure, thanks for having me on. Well, you know, as Tom W. Bell said, copyright is not, cannot, and was never intended to be a perpetual copyright. Uh, but in recent years, Congress has regularly extended copyright terms to ensure that copyright would never expire, to the point where some people in my generation don't even know that copyright is supposed to expire. They just assume it lasts forever. We have copyright on the installment plan. And uh, we know the costs of this. Um, I talk to a lot of artists and content creators. I haven't heard a single one say, oh, yeah, this, this current system is working just great for me. Um, between our deficiencies with fair use and excessively long copyright terms, we're actually hindering, copy, we're actually hindering the content creation. Um, you know, empires like the Walt Disney Empire would never exist today if they had to operate under current copyright law. And unbelievably, this is exactly what the founders warned us about. 200 years ago, James Madison wrote an essay on monopolies, and he said, on the whole, these things are very dangerous. We had a lot of experience of them being you know, particularly dangerous to a free society. However, two of these monopolies are written in the Constitution because the benefits outweigh the costs, monopolies and patents. But then Madison did something a little bit unusual. He added a phrase in there, almost a warning to future generations. He says, these instruments must be guarded with strictness against abuse. And make no mistake about it, I worked in Congress. I saw this up close and personal. There is no more extreme example of corruption and cronyism than U.S. policy on copyright law. Why? Because exactly as Madison predicted 200 years ago, there is essentially no one on the other side to argue in behalf of content creators and the general public. And I'm sure the people watching this on Twitter, we're going to get a whole bunch of them from the chamber and from the MPA and RA, and they're going to say, what about Google money? What about all these other companies? But you can look at the record. And when the Sonny Bono Act was up for extension in the 1990s, there wasn't a single company lobbying on the other side. And Senator Bond said in the congressional record, where is the other side? Is there not another side to this argument? And what we see today is Senator Chris Dodd, a different Dodd, basically warning senators, if you don't support him on copyright policies today, don't come and ask for a paycheck tomorrow. And that's the only explanation for a policy that we have today that is now being solidified in the Trans-Pacific Partnership Treaty. I think Zach dropped off there. Great. Um, yeah, Mitch. Yeah. Uh, uh, thanks, Zach and, and R Street for putting this on. This is really important conversation at a really important time. We seem to have an opportunity with the House Judiciary Committee looking into this, 
with uh, the Patent and Trademark Office, Department of Commerce, other groups within government, taking a, a really deep and broad look at where we are and where we might go. Now, I don't know what I don't know what the result of that will be, or or how comprehensive a change is coming, or when, but. It's. I think it's heartening that that so many people of so many different opinions, you know, are recognizing this and 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 taking a hard look at it. And it's a much broader spectrum of of folks this time to kind of bring uh, bring Tom's history up to the the last few decades uh, a bit. Uh, historically, copyright law was created by consensus among the industry is the small number of industries that it really was affected directly. So publishing, motion pictures, uh, um, uh, music, photography. Um, basically, they had representatives sit in a room, hash out compromises, and copyright, uh, and, and Congress uh, enacted those into law. And that was just kind of historically how it was done for really probably most of the 20th century, at least, and probably earlier. Um, what changed, of course, was was the internet. Whereas copyright once really only affected a thousand or so people who owned a printing press and a couple hundred people who owned a, a record pressing factories and uh, some major publishers and, and 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 what have you. Of course, now we all have all of those things in our pockets, and that makes copyright a regime that imp that regulates our daily lives in very intimate ways. Really important, uh, it regulates our our political participation and our self-expression and our communications. That's that's what's different now. And over the course of the last 20 years, 20, 30 years, there historically really about every two or three years there have been an expansion of copyright law passed into law. You know, at the direction of the major entertainment industries. So you don't have to take my word for this. There's a list of bills on the uh, Copyright Office website, and uh, you can sort of see the, the the progression of this. And each one of those was presented as a binary choice: pass this bill, or we have anarchy. Stre strengthen copyright and make it broader and 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 last longer, or we have no copyright. That's been the rhetoric around the uh, around these these bills. Um, you know that's changed. I feel like there is more, there is greater public participation. We're all, we all have a stake in this, and I think a lot more people are realizing that now. And that's that's the opportunity that we have. So just to point out some key areas that where where I think uh, you know folks who are um, uh, concerned about free markets and uh, and liberty, um, you know, might be interested in, in in taking a look. Now, the term length, which which Derek mentioned, is one. Um, Surrounding the there was a there was a constitutional challenge uh, back in 2003 to the um, uh, extension of terms that failed in the Supreme Court. But in that process, there was a lot of really good um, economic scholarship about what a good term length should be. I think Tom touches on this as well. Um, there's a good basis for that. Uh, but aside from that, um, um, reforming civil litigation around copyright. Um, Specifically, civil penalties in the uh, copyright law, which are right now a little bit of a game of Russian roulette. The penalties uh, that are in a range of seven hundred and fifty dollars to one hundred and fifty thousand dollars per infringed work. There are not good guidelines that guide judges and juries uh, on that. So the 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 result of a copyright lawsuit is unpredictable and often unfair and that's discouraging a lot of really important entrepreneurism un entrepreneurship and artistic creation and uh, investment in small business um, simply adding guidelines making those penalties more uh, transparent more predictable and more rational goes a long way the other one that I'll throw out is um, uh, protecting physical property rights. Again, getting at uh, what uh, Tom had mentioned about uh, that, that if there, for, for folks with, with really a core interest in um, protecting historically what we'll think of as, as, as property rights, rights in physical property, there are particular aspects of copyright 
that uh, can really interfere with that. Um, aspects that prevent people from repairing their own digital devices, from reselling digital devices potentially, reusing, recycling, um, modifying things that they legitimately are physical goods with embedded computing resources in them. And I'm, and I'm just talking about smartphones, I'm talking about cars, I'm talking about appliances. Everything has code in it, and that, and that code is covered by copyright. And copyright right now is, is really putting roadblocks in the way of personal dominion over those personal goods. So that's, I think, a, a, an area that, that's really ripe for change. Uh, and I'll leave it at that. Great. Uh, let's move to Ryan. I'm um, hoping you can both give us your thoughts and reflect a little bit about what everyone else has said so far. Sure. I take a somewhat different view on copyright than uh, Mitch and Derek and Tom. I see copyright all in all as a vehicle the, for helping move forward the engine of human flourishing. Copyright is an elegant and effective, albeit imperfect, system uh, for, for facilitating markets in creative works that would otherwise go uncreated or unexploited or both. There are certainly areas of copyright that are ripe for reform. As Mitch mentioned some. We can uh, discuss those uh, uh, over the next few minutes. But the core fundamental aspect of copyright, uh, securing to creators of expressive works uh, a limited right uh, to exploit the economic value of those works, uh, except when others wish to uh, uh, parody them or transform them, has served society very well. It creates the sort of positive sum situation that furthers our interaction with creative works, with markets in general. So this idea that copyright is a privilege, that it's a special limit on real property that we should be skeptical of, to me is mistaken. Of course, if you make a thousand copies of a book on your photocopier, you are technically violating the Copyright Act if the work is protected. But copyright holders aren't going to sue you for doing that because they're not going to be able to know about it. It's Similarly, if you go down the street and you read, uh, recite Martin Luther King's I Have a Dream speech, you're not going to get sued, highly unlikely. On the other hand, if you're a corporation and you air that speech, or distribute a copyrighted work on a commercial basis, then you might face liability. Even still, of course, there are many types of works that are protected, that are copyrighted, that the rights holders allow to be distributed. But if we view copyright for what it does in the vast majority of instances where it actually affects our behavior, it's not limiting our ability to, to, to make these sorts of de minimis or private uses of works in practice even if in theoretically it does. Instead, what copyright really does in terms of how it affects us is it allows those of us who create works to have a, a level of security in monetizing those works through markets. Of course, we don't all agree on exactly what copyright should look like. We don't all exactly agree what real property rights should look like either. If we lived in a truly free society, perhaps we would each consent to the precise meets and bounds of who owns what, we don't. Instead, we make decisions about how to allocate rights, both in rivalrous, tangible goods, and in, in intangible goods, which are certainly scarce in, in some respects, even, even if not in all regards. So copyright helps creators, but in so doing it helps us enjoy the, the fruits of their labor. Uh, to the extent that it's been argued that copyright doesn't really help the little guy. It only protects the big companies. Well, one reason that's the case is because if you're a creator of copyrighted works, you have very little ability, if your works are being infringed widely, uh, to effectively police infringement of those works unless you expend the resources uh, to pay a company to, to go out and send takedown notices. That's one reason 
why many individuals partner with large companies that specialize not just in financing, monetizing, distributing works, but also in protecting and securing works. So I, I, I hope that Congress, as it looks at areas of the Copyright Act that could be improved, uh, considers areas of reform, but let's not throw out the baby with the bathwater. Copyright is a system that served us well. It will continue to serve us well. It's why, uh, or a major reason why, the United States is the home to creative industries that uh, no one other nation in the world rivals. Great. Thank you, Ryan. Um, so I'd like to move a little bit to some questions we've been getting on Twitter and on Google Plus uh, about the idea of what the constitutional uh, vision for copyright was. Um, first of all, I know, Tom, in your book you talk about how the original scope of what was covered under copyright was much more limited uh, than it is today. I was hoping you could first expand a little bit on what that was and how we got to where we are and secondly to explain if you think that expansion of the scope of copyright makes economic sense. Hmm. Okay. Um, all right, so let's talk a bit about how the Founders Copyright, the Copyright Act of 1790 was really very different from today's Copyright Act. A very kind of gross measure, it tells you something but not everything, is that the 1790 Copyright Act had just over a thousand words. It had about a thousand three hundred and eight words, which is about twice twice the level of a, twice the number of a short op-ed. So you know you could fit it on two three sheets of paper, and they did. The present Copyright Act has well over seventy thousand words, and I'm not counting in that all the regulations the Copyright Office puts out. So it's gotten huge, huge now. It started lean and mean. But let's look at the content. You can't just count words. As I noted, the maximum term under the Founders Copyright was just 28 years. And that in an era when people didn't live as long, okay? In fact, it was a 14-year term, and you didn't get the additional 14-year term unless you went through some formalities. Now, because of the Berne Convention, we don't have much by way of formalities anymore. Now the term is, well, it depends on the work, but for um, an individual person, it's life of the author, really, really death of the author, plus 70 years. So you create a work when you're... 35, you live another 35 years to 70, you're looking at over 100 years compared to 28. And, and it's 120 for corporations, is that right? Yes. If it's a corporation, it can be up to 120. Let's talk about the rights granted. The Founders Copyright basically only protected against exact duplications. Exact duplications. It did not protect against derivative works. So my book, which I've released, again, I've released this book under the Founders Copyright, you can do a musical of that, and I can't stop you. Go for it. You want to do a translation? That's fine. Today, copyright covers all kinds of stuff. Derivative works is why you get, you know, film rights from books. It's why people bring lawsuits against parodies that they don't like, pretending they have copyright claims. Also, public display, public distribution, public performance, nowhere in the Founders Copyright Act. Subject matter. Copyrights cared about three things. You ready for this? This will blow your mind. Books, maps, and charts, and that is all. And they knew about sculpture, they knew about painting, they knew about architecture, they knew about all that stuff, and they loved it. They weren't a bunch of Philistines, they were cultured people. But they did not see fit to protect it. Why? Because for them, copyright was a matter of industrial policy. They were trying to build a country. They were not interested in this European notion that artists have poured their souls into their expressive works and we have to protect them ad nauseum. In France, an author can actually disavow her works and demand that a book be taken off the shelves. Well, that's just nuts. That's not the American way. It's not the way the founders saw it. Unfortunately, that idea has kind of infected American copyright law. One last thing I'll say, remedies. You didn't get to throw people in jail in the founders' era for violating copyright. You didn't even get to seize a... Well, the way they, you didn't get to do much at all. In fact, you didn't get to sue for damages. All they had was statutory damages, which in, I've done the math on this. Today, that would be about... They allowed up to $6 per page of infringing, infringing works. Whereas today, you can get up to $150,000 per infringed work and uh, destruction of infringing copies. So if somebody like did a copy of a map, an exact copy, not a derivative work, you could have those copies destroyed, and the infringing party would have to pay 50 cents, I think it was, a page. 
Today, as I noted, $150,000 statutory damages, possible imprisonment if you're basically a pirate, we could call them. Um, certainly statutory, uh, uh, actual damages, unjust profits, injunctive relief, the power to subpoena a digital service provider to get the name of someone who's allegedly infringing. The list just goes on and on. Today they hit them with a hammer, hard, and many times. So the founders had a very different view of copyright. Your second question, I'll move on to that one, Zach, was what does this tell us about economic policy? It tells us how screwed up we have it, <laughs> frankly. So here's why. Well, as I mean, I'll point, I'll, I'll jump in that as Ryan pointed out, uh, it encourages a lot of, of creative markets that would otherwise maybe be somewhere else. Uh, you talked about how the original scope of copyright didn't cover, you know, expressive works or uh -huh. songs or sculpture. Uh, but do you think it makes economic sense to have those protections the way we do? Well, um, I'll say a couple things about that. One is nobody knows for certain. Again. People have this vision that lawmakers are turning these dials and reading these numbers. Nobody knows. It is a very rough, I don't even know if I can call it a science, it's a very rough business creating copyright legislation. Secondly, I'll just tell you my gut level view of this. I think in many areas that are now protected in copyright, we would have just as many expressive original works as before and maybe more without copyright. So for example, now let me give. Let me interrupt you and give sure. some other people a chance to jump in. Um, All right, have at it. Do you, did, would anyone else care to dispute that point? Well, I, I, if I could just add, the, and going back to something that I'd said before, I don't, I don't think that we are faced with a binary choice, copyright or no copyright. I certainly don't think that various expansions that have been proposed, or whether that's a, essentially like a a duty for intermediaries to monitor their services for infringement, whether it's changing the term, um, whether it's greater exemptions for uh, that, that protect uh, uh, rights of, of free speech and entrepreneurship. Um, none of those is a choice between copyright and no copyright. Those are, those are adjustments that, are, that can be based on empirical evidence mm -hmm. that um, uh, will hopefully fulfill all of these goals. Now, uh, an additional question I have from uh, Google for Derek. Uh, the, uh, I have Tom uh, Giovanetti ask, from the Institute for Policy Innovation uh, online asking um, that you quoted Madison uh, on your ideas about copyright reform. Uh, whereas he seems to espouse uh, strong support for copyright in Federalist 43. Um, he says uh, specifically the utility of the copyright clause will scarcely be questioned. The copyright of authors has been solemnly adjudged in Great Britain to be a right of common law. The right to useful inventions seem with equal reason to belong to the inventors. The public good fully coincides in both cases with the claim of individuals. Um, do you care to... I mean, it, it's almost so stupid that I don't think it deserves to be treated with a serious response, but because he's been able to mislead so many people, I, I feel like I have to respond. First of all, there have been a lot of Twitter chatter that uh, some of us are anti-copyright. That's just a, a, a ridiculous notion. I support the copyright as written in the Constitution. Uh, for those who want copyright to last forever and want people to go to jail for the rest of their life for relatively minor uh, e examples of piracy, which I don't condone either, but those people are actually anti-copyright because they want something that was very alien from what the founders asked for. Now, as for this quote, you know, deliberately misquoting the founders and trying to use that as a basis for your argument, that's just downright unethical. Uh, so Madison, what he was talking about here, uh, he was talking about a Supreme Court decision or the equivalent of that in Great Britain. Now, Tom W. Bell has done a lot of work on this subject. And um, Madison was giving a legal opinion on the state of common law on Britain. And unfortunately, Madison was wrong because the decision had come out about a year before invalidating that perspective. And the highest court in the land in Great Britain, the House of Lords, uh, they adjudicated the matter and they decided no. Copyright is not a common law right. And so if you read Madison's quotation in context, he's giving a legal opinion. This has been adjudicated, not saying I personally think so. And to some extent, he was relying upon a case. He was right. It was adjudicated at one point. 
uh, but it was slightly out of date, and at the time it took a little while for some of these legal opinions to travel. So Tom W. Bell can jump in on that. But to take that one line from the Federalist Papers that has been so thoroughly debunked and ignore an essay written by James Madison on this exact topic is just completely disingenuous, and I'm not surprised by the, one of the leading organizations that receives money from the MPAA. <laughs> yeah, I, I just want to say, preach it, brother, and uh, just absolutely right on that when Derek describes how Madison, well, I'll be a little less charitable, much as I respect Madison, he got it wrong. What he said was a little bit like me saying today, slavery has been judged constitutional under the U.S. Constitution. Is that true? It is true because at one time the Supreme Court said that, but then it was reversed, thank goodness. So that's kind of what Madison did. He said, oh, it's been adjudged under common law to be a form of property. Well, uh, for a little bit, and then they decided, whoops, big mistake. So I can't really say that was fair what Madison did, if he did it knowingly. Maybe it was an honest mistake. But it's not something to cite in support of your position, modern advocates of copyright. you got to do the history on that one. Now... Well, can I jump in? Go ahead, Ryan. Yeah, it, go ahead. Yeah, I find it frustrating how often modern copyright conversations get into the question of what the founders thought. Uh, you know, Tom Penn had mentioned slavery. The founders' constitution allowed slavery. It denied women the right to vote. It had lots of problems. The founders were smart people, but we shouldn't shape modern copyright law with with, with the thinking that, that they applied in a world where the state of technology, economics, law was nowhere near what it is today. Ultimately, it doesn't really matter what Madison thought about copyright. We, we, we all agree that the Constitution allows Congress to create copyrights. We can maybe disagree on the details of how long that term can be constitutionally, but fundamentally, it's, it's up to Congress to, to, uh, to set out what copyright looks like. It's, it's up to, uh, to the voters, to the people, to influence copy Congress and to vote for representatives to implement the copyright law that, that they prefer. Uh, I'd also mention briefly, Tom talked about the, the, the vast length of copyright, and Mitch mentioned that it's not binary. Bringing those two points together, in some regards we have too much copyright, in some regards we have too little copyright. To agree with a point that Tom has made in, in, in his previous remarks, the best aspect of copyright law is its property right-like aspects. If you look at, say, sections one, 101 to 110 of the Copyright Act, just to, to truncate it, you have a basically a 20-page copyright act. You don't have a lot of the really long, complicated sections like Section 111, which deals with three transmissions by cable providers. You, you end up with a copyright law uh, that, that, while, again, still imperfect, uh, is simpler, shorter, and lacks a lot of the very technical uh, limitations and compulsory licenses and royalty payments that are, uh, that are the, the more administrative state-like attributes of copyright. We need to simplify copyright as Tom says, and a lot of that is already in the act if we just get rid of a lot of what's accumulated over the years. I agree with that. I do. Let the market take over a lot of these transactions. Right now it's ridiculous how much they've settled in the statute. Those people should be negotiating the marketplace with, with property rights as firm as we can make them. I mean, it is copyright, but we can do better than what we have. Now, another interesting question I have from uh, our audience is, Tom, uh, they ask you whether your book is copyrighted, and I know you have this great copyright note here uh, early on explaining how your book is protected. Would you care to explain that? Sure. Again, it's been released under the 1790 Copyright Act. So um, if I had done it on my own, I probably wouldn't have had a copyright. There is a song in there that's totally uncopyrighted, which I'd written. It's a substitute for Happy Birthday. But the book itself is copyrighted because the Berkata Center published it, and I want them to make some money. I'm getting no royalties from it, by the way. I'm donating all the royalties to them because I like their help, and they're wonderful people. So in 14 years, we have to figure out some way to renew the copyright on this. I'm not sure we can since there's no more <laughs> of, the, of the administrative machinery to do that. So maybe in 14 years, this will be in the public domain, certainly in 28. In 28 years, do what you will. And right now, again, because this is under the 1790 Copyright Act, you can do derivative works. You want to do a translation? Please, I welcome that. I'd love to have my friends in Germany reading this book, Japan, Korea, wherever. So make translations. I couldn't stop you if I wanted to. I wouldn't want to. Do a musical version? Heck, I'll come and sing in it. So the book is under copyright, but it's a very narrow kind of copyright, the kind of copyright I can support, which is basically how the founders did it. And look, I, I know tastes in the founders uh, uh, varies, but 
a lot of people would disagree with Ryan that we shouldn't care what Madison thought about copyright. And I'm among them because those are smart guys. They laid the foundations of our country. They deserve our respect, even Madison, who didn't always get the law right. When I compare those guys to the politicians we have today, I don't have any trouble figuring out who to listen to. <laughs> so moving on to another issue uh, that was recently at the Supreme Court and something that EFF has been working on quite a lot is the uh, infamous Aereo case. Uh, uh, Mitch, I was hoping you could just briefly kind of give us a rundown of what that entailed and then open up to a discussion on the merits of the case. Sure, happy to. Um, so the Aereo was a, a pretty young company, started in New York City. Um, the concept that the, the, they're, the, commercially what they're, what they're doing is bringing live local television to internet connected devices. The idea is that, that one can watch their local sports teams, local evening news, commercials and all, basically the same that you'd get uh, over the air, but on, uh, say, a smartphone or a tablet. Um, the, the way they're doing it, uh, based uh, uh, on some copyright decisions uh, out of the, the federal courts, is that they've put uh, an array of uh, thousands of tiny ten television antennas on a, a rooftop. Uh, and this started in New York. They've rolled out in a few other places. Um, every subscriber is assigned one antenna, which acts then just as if it were on that subscriber's rooftop or in their hand. Uh, the signal from that antenna passes through a digital video recorder, which, which does personal recordings as would a, a DVR or a, um, or a slingbox, um, uh, and, and from there to the, the user's device. Now, the, the narrow legal question, these, uh, Ariel was sued by TV broadcasters, including the, the major TV networks. The narrow question was whether what Aereo is doing constitutes a public performance, because copyright law contains an exclusive right of performing a work to the public, but it doesn't touch private performances, which would include uh, you know, private showing of something in one's house to one's family and friends, or uh, private transmission initiated by an individual for that individual's own benefit, so they're sending video to themselves over the internet the way that a, a slingbox does. Or, or various uh, uh, various other video technologies. Um, that's the narrow question. The, the broad question, I think, uh, and this case is was argued at the Supreme Court uh, in April, uh, and it will be decided probably sometime this month. The broad question is whether copyright gives copyright owners the power to control. In, in minute ways, the you know uh, the the viewing experience or the the way that a, a person who is legally legitimately in possession or or has, has legitimate access to to a work either they've paid for it or in the case of Aereo they're watching it on the public airwaves which are free and commercial supported but the, 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 there's there's no in that sense no piracy because this is people who have legitimate access to something how much control do copyright holders have over how that person can watch, where, when they can watch, what technology they can choose? Would well, anyone else care to jump in, give a different opinion? I would just go back and, and note that the cable companies that we know today had pretty humble beginnings. Uh, they started out being uh, known as community access television. We didn't have so-called basic cable channels, premium channels. Cable started out as a way of helping people who couldn't get reliable access to over-the-air broadcast signals to, to access that. So you'd have an antenna in a community, in a neighborhood or a city, that would be distributed to, to local homes. Businesses developed, eventually the broadcasters whose signals these cable companies were retransmitting for a fee were unhappy. They sued. It went to the Supreme Court in a series of cases, fortnightly in teleprompter. The broadcasters lost. The Supreme Court said it's okay for cable companies to take an antenna, acquire the signal, retransmit it for a fee. Congress in 1976 said, no, that's not what we think. So they rewrote the Copyright Act. One thing that they did was say, 
that when a cable company retransmits a broadcast signal, it has to pay a fee and obtain a statutory license for doing so. There's a complicated formula that we don't need to get into for de deciding how much that is. The point is, a co cable companies back in the 70s were doing what was the same as what Aereo is doing today in functional terms, fun economic terms. They were using lots of tiny antennas. I don't know if, uh, how technologically feasible it was back then, but I'm pretty sure it wasn't as cheap as it was today. But the idea that Congress possibly could have thought, well, it's okay for cable companies to retransmit these channels if they have lots of little antennas in one place, but not if they have one, doesn't make any sense to me. Now, there's, a, there's, there's good arguments that have been made about why if, you, if the Supreme Court rules against Aereo, it could have implications elsewhere. I don't think that are, that those concerns are, are valid, but I understand where they're coming from, and I think they, they're made in good faith. However, if you just look at what Aereo is doing, it's, uh, it is taking content that is indeed distributed over the airwaves, it's selling it, helping people skip commercials for a fee of about 10 bucks a month. Now, I think if, if you were to start a business, and your business model was you took all of the major news websites, New York Times, CNN, and so forth, you took all their content and you redistributed it, stripped up the ads, and sold it for 10 bucks a month, I think you would be pretty clearly committing copyright infringement. You would be, you're, you're, that's, that's precisely the core sort of misappropriation of value that the Copyright Act is supposed to stop. So the, the notion that air, what Aereo is doing ought to be okay to me is uh, is, is fairly absurd uh, as, as a matter of policy. Uh, of, of course, because this is a 1976 law, it's not crystal clear. We, we wrote a brief uh, making arguments on one side. Uh, EFF and others uh, argued on the other side. But as a policy matter, it's hard to say that we should, we should welcome uh, Aereo's proliferating across industries of creative works if we actually care about protecting them. Uh, especially for the for for works that are very newly created, like the ones that Aereo is distributing by and large. Well, if I can just add a, a, a many steps back view of this, I don't really disagree with what Ryan said, but then again, I, I think Mitch got it right too. Basically, I think take many steps back, you'll see the problem is built into the system. It's really more than a copyright problem; it's a telecommunications problem. So there's three things that I see that are problematic in the whole Aereo mess. Two of them are in copyright, and that is the must-carry provisions. Why? We don't need that. We should get rid of that. Uh, why are we controlling that market? And the statutory royalties. So on the one hand, the cable companies have to take this stuff. They have to rebroadcast the, the broadcast signals, and they can't negotiate a separate rate. If they got like a really hit broadcast show, they're stuck with the statutory royalties. No, we should just make this more simple. Say, here's what we should say if we get rid of the third thing. Broadcasters, you own the copyright. Milk the market for as much as you can. What's that third thing, though? Huh? Broadcasters got to give all, up all that bandwidth they have. They're sitting on all this bandwidth we could be using to make our cell phones better, and they're just—it's just a huge gift to the broadcasters. It's not hard to see why. I'm not as enamored of, of Ryan is of what came out of Congress because I think I can guess what happened in Congress. The cable companies lobbied the bejesus out of Congress. I'm not sure I like that result at all. But anyhow, it wouldn't be an issue if what broadcasters had to pay for their their spectrum. They should have to do that, I think. It's not really copyright, but that's a missing part of the puzzle. No must carry, no statutory royalties. Just everybody on the same playing field. I, I actually agree with, with that, with just one minor caveat, which is on the taking their spectrum side, uh, we certainly shouldn't have given it away for free in the first place through the command and control method. The problem is that a lot of the entities that have those licenses today acquired them on the market through transactions. So I think yeah. you have some reliance interest problems with, with taking it without giving them anything. I think they've got to get – some of them have to get something, but we can, we can put a lot of that spectrum toward, toward a more highly valued use. And I, I certainly agree with everything else you said. Yeah, politically, Ryan, I think the only way to make it happen is you say to the broadcasters, guys, you own it, and you can sell it. And we'll let the market decide there. It's a huge gimme, but, you know, we've already done that. And you can't unwind these things. You have to – it's hard to unwind them. You have to buy the peace with the retiring regime. And I, I foresee that as the only political way to make it happen. You say, broadcasters, your spectrum, your copyrights, good luck. <laughs> if, I, if I could just add this, this – the, the, the basic economic uh, argument that, that Ryan made is – it's, it's compelling, but it's not really historical. Uh, I, as I see what, what, what he's saying basically as um, anyone who, uh, whose business derives value from 
um, creative work um, must be must must compensate and must be under the control of the copyright holders. Um, there's there is an appeal to that. The problem with it is that's that's not actually what our law has ever been, and there's really good reasons why it shouldn't be. Um, a television, a TV set, it would have no value without television programming, and yet the manufacturers of the television set, the law does not compel them to uh, pay royalties. And even more importantly, the law doesn't give copyright owners the power to veto the features of the television or to set the price of the television or to decide who can have the television. That's just one example, but the you know the Aereo case is an extension of that argument. If I could jump in here to go back to a point that Ryan was saying, he was saying you know who really cares about what the founders thought in his opinion? Well, uh, you know you don't have to have an originalist-based argument. That's kind of how I come at it: is trying to figure out where the founders were coming from and and whether or not our laws are consistent with the Constitution accordingly. But uh, maybe Ryan has a different perspective on this. Uh, so we know that copyright terms have increased by 580% from that versus the founding era, whereas patent terms have increased by 43%. And of course, it costs about a billion dollars to get a drug through the FDA. So there's certainly an argument that, in, in, that you need to be able to recapture those externalities. So, you know, what is the argument in favor of copyright for 120 years? Because I just can't find one, either from the founders or from Milton Freeman, who wanted to show a copyright, or, or well, Friedrich Hayek, who is the basis of modern property law. Right. Also, also to jump in here, I think it's important to clarify whether we see the founders' view of copyright as a limited monopoly or uh, an intellectual privilege, as Tom Bell puts it in his book, or a... Uh, a limited, uh, the limited monopoly versus natural right uh, idea. Uh, but I think it's pretty clear they didn't have a natural rights view, and you can see that merely in the fact that, one, they didn't protect it for very long at all, and two, they didn't protect all these other obviously originally expressive works, like paintings and music, sculptures, architecture. So they didn't have a natural rights view, or they would have done that. It, again, it was just industrial policy for them. They looked around, they said, we're trying to build a country here, what do we need? We need maps and charts, so we know where to go and where not to put our ships. And we need books. Can books, I've done research on this, books in their era were mostly kind of things like agricultural tracts. The novel had only just been invented, really. So they weren't looking at things, when they looked at books, they thought books, they thought stuff that helped, you, you know, these are, these are useful tracts. They also had a lot of religious tracts, too, in their libraries, and that's how we know this. We go back and we look at, what did the founders have in their libraries? There was hardly any novels, a little bit of poetry, mostly scripture, agriculture, books about how to build a country. <laughs> I, I think it, it's, it's totally fair to say the founders didn't equate copyright with real property as being truly equal. Uh, the Constitution is clear that if Congress uh, takes or a government takes your real property, your land, it has to compensate with the fair value. Congress doesn't have the discretion to, to take that at, at, at a whim. In, in the world of, of copyright, Congress didn't have to create a Copyright Act in the first place. It would have been pure, entirely constitutional had, had Congress elected not to provide for limited times a copyright. It has that choice. So the founders certainly, uh, there's the, 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 the text itself, uh, suggest the founders thought it was somewhat less crucial than real property. On the other hand, the founders didn't give Congress a whole lot of powers. They chose to expressly give it the power to create copyrights. So I think uh, if you're going to call it industrial policy, uh, it's it's one of the few types of industrial policy that's actually in the Constitution, which suggests that we should be uh, less skeptical of copyright than a lot of the other inventions that the modern state has come up with over the, the intervening centuries. Well, those are even more constitutional. It's almost all unconstitutional, frankly, what goes on in D.C., if you're going to take a very strict reading of the Constitution. And I will say that's a nice thing about copyright. It's less unconstitutional than so much else that they do, sad to say. Just say yeah, that is, that, is anyone surprised he used to be at the Cato Institute? <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> oh, the Constitution also gives Congress the, uh, the power to grant letters of mark, but that doesn't mean I have the right to be a privateer. Actually, uh, wasn't it 
Ron Paul who recently suggested that, that we should use that to <laughs> solve the uh, missing children in Africa and some of the other foreign policy matters we've been getting into lately. <laughs> um, does anyone else have any uh, remarks on constitutional copyright before I move on? I know, I know we've seen a lot of arguments uh, from advocates for strong IP who seem to take uh, a more of a natural rights view. Uh, and I know, Derek, you've encountered uh, this argument a number of times with your recent paper. Yeah, I mean, it's just intellectually disingenuous. Um, I would love to have an actual debate on this topic. Uh, my, my paper with R Street, uh, with, with you guys, has a 13-point bolded list on the problems with natural rights copyright. I mean, it, it just... It's it's like going around and arguing that the sky is purple. I mean, you can say it, but you're going to have to really argue that point pretty severely because I can just look outside and realize that the sky is generally not purple. <laughs> um, and, and that's basically the issue here with natural rights is uh, you could say it's natural rights, but the founders didn't believe that it was natural rights. Uh, there really isn't a whole lot to go on, but uh, I'll hear you out. I, I made 13 separate <laughs> points, and none of them have been rebutted except for you know, content industry lobbyists who right. just jump up and down and say it's property, 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 property. Well, I, I just made these arguments, and you haven't rebutted any of them. The best we've heard is this, you know, lame Federalist paper that they're misinterpreting for Madison. I mean, you're going to have to do better than that. All right, our few minutes remaining, I'd like to move on to sort of what seems to be a new frontier uh, on copyright policy that's been debated in House Judiciary recently, which is the uh, problems with digital goods resale, uh, the first sale doctrine, there's in the last few years, there have been companies like Redigi, which claim to offer you the ability to uh, resale music you've bought online, uh, but more in other ways, we're seeing computers and software in more and more devices in our cars and thermostats, and sort of the question of whether we can still uh, resell those in a functional way seems to be. Uh, you know, pushing the boundaries of current copyright law. Um, would anyone like to start off and weigh in on that question? I'll take a whack at it. I think I'll offer you a view that you won't get very often, at least. That doesn't mean it's right. Uh, it seems to me that in cases like this, you have an argument for copyright misuse. And there's a chapter in my book about copyright misuse. It's a doctrine that hasn't gotten enough attention. It's really interesting. I'll just use one example. Suppose I buy a device and it's shrink-wrapped and the license makes me promise to not engage in criticism of the software on the device. So it's trying to take away contractually my fair use rights. Most courts would regard that as copyright misuse. And the remedy for that would be that the company selling me this, this licensed device cannot enforce its copyright rights so long as it's engaged in misuse. But it can enforce its contract rights. And that is the world I think we want to be in. Where we, see it, we say to companies that try to grab too much, they take their copyright and they combine it with licensing terms and they just grab too much, we say to them, that's too much. You've got to give up something. You've got to give up the copyright and stand on your common law rights, only the license terms. And what do I like about that? Well, for one thing, it's common law, not this statutory privilege. For another thing, the remedies for violating a contract are much less draconian than the remedies for violating a copyright. So it tempers the ability of these companies to lock down everything. But nonetheless, it does leave them free to use contracts and only contracts to do what they can in the marketplace. Anyone else? Well, I, I think that the notion of, of digital first sale is... Uh, first, it reflects how consumers don't always understand that they're well, when they click buy... Uh, when it's a song or something or a movie, they're often not buying it in the traditional sense as if they're buying a DVD. They're rather buying a license. It may often be uh, non-transferable, as is as is the case with most Kindle books, for instance. Uh, I, I it, it's a good thing that the Copyright Act says that if you buy a, a lawfully made copy, that that you can distribute it, and it, it can be distributed. That, that the initial distribution right is exhausted. Uh, it, there's an interesting question whether the, that should also apply to a digital copy. If you buy copies of a thousand songs, uh, you put a, uh, you put you have it on your iPod, you can sell that iPod. That's a lawful transaction. But if you want to sell those thousand songs and delete them, but keep the iPod under current law, 
you you can't do that. Uh, I think there's a good case to be made that we we ought to uh, Congress ought to amend the Copyright Act to allow a model whereby uh, a person who has a copy of a song, not a license, but a copy, can forward that song, uh, sell that song as long as they delete it. On the other hand, there needs to be a protection of licensing arrangements that limit things like the ability to tra the right to transfer a copyright, uh, that limit your ability to forward your your song to another person. Uh, so I'm skeptical of uh, coming up with these these broad of of a, of a broad reading of copyright misuse that would allow courts to come up with all of these types of licensing arrangements that that are that are void for policy reasons. Um, the criticism angle doesn't doesn't does not trouble me too much, but when you start to say uh, you can't, uh, well, let's worse. I'm, I'm assuming that these are otherwise enforceable contracts. We'll say they're they're click wrap, not not shrink wrap, and and you you see the contract before you complete the transaction. I'd like to see those licensing terms generally be enforceable uh, and, and not result in the copyright being being uh, being held invalid or limited, ex except in cases where they're really egregious terms. Now, is there an important distinction there for you know, firmware or software that's essential for a device to work, say a wireless router or a car these days? Sure. The, the, uh, the application of copyright to firmware is in, when it's used for purposes that don't actually implicate the value of the work strikes me as troubling. We see this in the cell phone unlocking debate. When you have to make a, a an incidental or a, a copy of of the the firmware to jailbreak the phone or, or to to carry or unlock it or something, that's not a, a a situation that actually implicates the value of the software, even though it does implicate copying. Uh, Mitch probably uh, has something to add on that, but that to me is not the sort of type of conduct that copyright law is is supposed to be uh, uh, addressing. That should be addressed through uh, contract and property law. Yeah, I agree with you there, Ryan. But going back to what you meant, what you said about the buy button, you know, I worry that uh, the the what it means to buy something that that, that that's being changed sub rosa. That if the button on Amazon says buy, if the button on various di uh, um, uh, stores says says I, I says buy or says I or that the advertising speaks of ownership. But what you're owning is an ephemeral license that can effectively be terminated at any time when the company decides to shut down its authentication servers, and this has happened. Um, then what have you bought? You've bought you've bought nothing. Um, the pro I, there is a there is a disclosure problem, which which I think amounts to a uh, to misleading advertising, uh, which is. Uh, I think that's a framework for looking at that. I mean, you can, one can certainly license, lease, rent, um, have these alternative arrangements, but they need to be disclosed and not just in the fine print. I want to jump in here on the uh, you know the House Judiciary hearings. Uh, you know when this stuff started off, I was pretty excited. Particularly, it was you know very shortly after the House Republican Study Committee calling for reforms on copyright. Um, but it, the idea that we should simply be looking forward and not being willing to reconsider where our current policies is, are failing um, seems like a, a significant problem. We already know that excessively long copyright terms are responsible in large part for the orphan works epidemic, uh, for a lack of preservation of, of digital movies, for example. Uh, uh, you know, transaction costs going through the roof, artists having to get out of the business of content creation such as public enemy because of fair use laws and excessively long cop copyright terms. And so we have some of this tra tra chatter in the Twitter sphere, people saying, you know, why aren't you talking about uh, piracy? Why aren't you talking about piracy? Well, it's because every major conversation on copyright is on piracy. But yet that's one issue. It's one of many issues. People should not have their property being stolen. Agreed. I think we all agree with that. Uh, but the solution to piracy is not so clear, but we do know that uh, many of those who pirate are also the biggest consumers of lawful content. Now, that doesn't make their piracy lawful, but it does demonstrate that 
perhaps this isn't an existential issue to the industry. This is perhaps something that can be dealt with through new types of uh, technology, such as Spotify and Pandora and other streaming methods. And yeah, it's a shaky transition. And during the transition, there are going to be artists who are going to lose out, and that's unfortunate. But it happens in all transitions. And I don't have a solution to piracy. But just because we don't have a solution to piracy doesn't mean we shouldn't be able to talk about copyright being incredibly long or fair use statutes being incredibly vague. And yet the House Judiciary Committee seems utterly incapable of having a serious conversation on this issue. I mean, the number one issue that academics agree on, left, right, and center, copyright is too damn long. There literally isn't an explanation for Life Plus 70. But yet the House Judiciary Committee is having dozens of hearings on reforming copyright and not one hearing on how long copyright should be. I worked in Congress. I can tell you, that's not a coincidence. These things happen on purpose. Your answer is cronyism? Absolutely. And, you know, I, I wrote in my report, uh, some people are saying, you know, it's all Google on the other side. You know, there's these strong forces. Well, the, the Senate Judiciary Report from Hank Brown, 1996, I think it's a moral outrage. There isn't anyone speaking out for the public interest. He, he's acknowledging there was literally no one on the other side pushing against copyright extension. So, you know, the MPA and RA can make, you know, Google their boogeymen today, uh, but I don't make a dollar from them. I don't think Tom W. Bell does. And uh, the fact of the matter is Google doesn't lobby on these issues. We should have an honest conversation. How long do we want copyright terms to be? Can you actually defend Life Plus 70? All right. We're uh, reaching the end here. I'd like to close by asking each of you a question. Uh, so if you were dictator for a day, and you could make any changes to co current copyright law that you wanted, what would you do, and would you strengthen any aspects of it that you currently see as weak? <laughs> I'll say, I'll be really quickly, I'll do this really quickly, I'd say the 1790 Copyright Act, and I think maybe I would, I would want to expand it to cover computer software. It kills me to say that, but the founders didn't have computer software in mind. Uh -huh. Maybe movies too, because those are big ticket items. I do worry about those not being produced in sufficient quantities without copyright. But that's pretty much it. 1790 Copyright Act plus uh, the computer software and maybe movies. So you go back to uh, the way it was. Uh, back Bring in it the on original. back. Mm -hmm. and burn, burn to the contrary, notwithstanding. It would not consist. Uh, it wouldn't be compatible with the Burn Convention. But I'm okay with that. Since I'm dictating. But would you but would you keep software patentable? Would I keep software patents? Sorry, patents? Uh -huh. Oh probably probably not. I wow, when you're a dictator, a lot of stuff lands on your plate. I was just talking <laughs> copyright. <laughs> All right, Ryan. Time. You want to take it from here? How, how would you answer? Sure. Well, as I said earlier, I pretty much get rid of most of the Copyright Act after uh, after section one oh nine. I'd pair back some. Of, I'd pair back. Mm -hmm. I'd pair back some of the criminal penalties. Probably not all, but I'd I'd pair them back for infringement, not done for commercial gain. Uh, I I'd, I'd reduce statutory damages, especially for uh, non willful infringement. I would restore some formality since I'm dictator. I'm not bound by uh, uh, the FTAs or burn. Perhaps registration after a period of time with renewal. Um, I don't think that I'd do it 14 years. It would be a higher number. I would uh, revisit civil forfeiture in general, but it's, it's, since we're talking copyright, with respect to copyright, and I would uh, I would try to craft a statute that it deals with bad actors, who uh, whose policy uh, with respect to takedown notices is uh, to refuse to comply and instead respond with an obscenity laced email. Uh, precisely how to deal with that is, is, a, is a tough issue, but uh, some of the work that Congressman uh, Issa did back in uh, late 2011 uh, I think was promising in that regard, although uh, they, they didn't quite get there. Should I jump in here? I, Go I, ahead. Very, mu I very much like Ryan's laundry list there, and uh, rather than give my own, I'll just say one. Uh, if I could do one change, it would be to, to limit uh, civil money damages and copyright to the the actual uh, uh, measure of the actual harm, um, and which could be trebled in cases of willful infringement.
Is it my turn? Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I haven't, I'm not exactly sure on what the right answer is. Um, you know, it's like Clay Christensen with the innovator's dilemma. I can tell you what the theory of the case is. I don't know exactly what the solution is. I think we should bring in the economists and, and sit down and figure out where the benefit is and uh, you know, where you can get the most bang for the buck out of copyright. And, and I would probably lean towards something uh, closer to the copyright law we had before 1976, uh, before we adopted Life Plus 50. Um, there have been a lot of studies on the optimal term of copyright, and uh, I would I would lean it to the economists to figure out the uh, best copyright term that's going to work for the content creators themselves, and also the general public. Uh, but beyond that, we have to really reverse the statutory damage regime, and uh, there may be a need for in cases of large piracy, for example. But when you apply statutory damages to content creators themselves. Um, that really demonstrates how the RA and MPA do not actually represent content creators because you're saying that you know the Beastie Boys could be liable for you know 20 million dollars potentially for unlicensed samples on one CD and that's just insane. Um, and uh, Terry Hart with the Copyright Alliance is tweeting at me and saying Public Enemy still makes music. I don't know what world he's in. I've talked to Hank Shockley and he says the reason they got out of the music business was because they couldn't secure the samples anymore and that copyright law changed so much they had to change the way that they made music. I actually quote to that in my piece. Um, so we've we, we got to fix the fair use statutes, we've got to shorten copyright terms, you know, whatever the economists say and content creators and the general public need and we've got to really reverse the statutory damage regime. All right. Thank you everyone for joining us today. That's all the time we have. You can find the video afterwards on our YouTube channel. Have a good day, everyone. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Thanks, Zach. Thank Thanks. you.